Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Life in the Universe pandemic series. Uh, so these are just a set of short talks that I've put together about topics to do with life in the universe that I thought would be interesting. And today's question is this one. Uh, where did all the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere come from? And this is uh, turns out to be an astoundingly interesting question. Uh, most of you probably take for granted the fact that you walk around and breathe the oxygen in the air uh, and it's there in, in plentiful supply in the Earth's atmosphere. But this wasn't always the case. In fact, when the Earth first formed uh, in the protoplanetary disk from which our solar system emerged, uh, the planet probably had an atmosphere of hydrogen and helium at the very beginning. And those gases, which are very light, tended to dissipate and disappear from the Earth. Eventually, they were replaced by gases uh, inside the Earth and probably some of it delivered by early asteroids and comets, things like carbon dioxide, uh, nitrogen, other gases as well. And that mixture of gases that contained probably some volcanic gases as well, like hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, was certainly toxic, at least uh, toxic to you and I. You could not have walked around on the early Earth four and a half billion years ago and breathed that gas. It would have been absolutely lethal. So this was an early atmosphere uh, without really any oxygen at all. And the question is, how do we know that? How do we know that there was no oxygen uh, in the early Earth's atmosphere? And I have to say, as a non-geologist, I find it really quite remarkable that uh, geologists can use tiny grains of material uh, from four billion years ago, three and a half billion years ago, and they can work out exactly what the Earth's atmosphere contained, because they don't actually have uh, a sample of the early Earth's atmosphere. If you go to Antarctica, you can drill into the ice there and you can extract bubbles of gas from the polar ice that will tell you exactly what the Earth's atmosphere was like, say, 50,000 years ago, because you actually have a, a real uh, ex direct uh, sample of that gas from that time period. But we have no um, samples of gas of atmosphere from three and a half billion years ago. So we have to use indirect methods to find out uh, what the atmosphere contained. And we call these um, proxies, geological proxies, something that indirectly tells us about something we're interested to find out. Now, you and I uh, are familiar with the fact that if you leave your bicycle outside or anything else uh, made of iron, it tends to rust. And the reason why it rusts is because that iron is reacting with the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere and causing it to go rusty. If you put your bicycle outside and there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, it wouldn't rust so quickly. So geologists can look at minerals uh, that formed on the early Earth and essentially have a look and see whether they rusted or whether they oxidized. And the way in which these elements and minerals react uh, with the atmosphere on the early Earth can tell us whether there was oxygen there or not. And if you look for ancient minerals on the early Earth, you'll, think, you'll find things like pyrite, um, sulfide minerals, and certain carbonate minerals that are very difficult to form in an atmosphere that has lots of oxygen. And these minerals tell geologists that the early Earth had virtually no oxygen at all. And there are many other ways in which they can do this. They can look at things like isotopes, uh, which are forms of an element with different numbers of neutrons, and those different forms of elements are also affected by whether there's oxygen in the atmosphere. So using a whole range of these rather cunning and clever methods, geologists can put all the information together and they can tell that the early Earth hardly had any oxygen. So then the question is, where did all this oxygen come from that we breathe, that you and I breathe today? Well, the rock record tells us that 2.4 billion years ago, the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere suddenly rose to several percent of what it was today, it's sometimes called the Great Oxidation Event. And the Great Oxidation Event is this time when oxygen rose. And scientists can tell that happened by looking at these uh, minerals that I just spoke about and seeing how they changed over time. And you can see that after about 2.4 billion years ago, some of these minerals become oxidized, telling you that there was oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. So the first question we might ask is, where did all this oxygen come from? OK, it suddenly rose 2.4 billion years ago or thereabouts. Uh, where did it come from? Well, it came from cyanobacteria, sometimes called blue-green algae. 
And these are the things you can see growing on the outside of a public building or in a pond. And they uh, photosynthesize using sunlight and they produce oxygen as a waste product. And this oxygen would have been belched out into the early Earth's atmosphere, uh, eventually accumulating in our, in our atmosphere. So the cyanobacteria were the, uh, uh, the culprits of this great pollution event that produced all this oxygen that filled the Earth's atmosphere. Um, there's only one mystery about this, is that we think that cyanobacteria evolved long before 2.4 billion years ago or thereabouts. So why didn't they fill the air with oxygen much earlier? Well, there's also a way in which oxygen will be consumed. So as you produce oxygen, it will react with gases like methane and hydrogen and other uh, gases that are called reduced gases. And these reducing gases will mop up the oxygen and destroy it, if you like. And there are other ways in which oxygen can be eliminated from the atmosphere as well. And all of these ways uh, counteract the production of oxygen from the cyanobacteria. So we've got a bit of a battle going on between production of oxygen by cyanobacteria and it being mopped up by um, things like hydrogen and other uh, gases in the early atmosphere. So what must have happened 2.4 billion years ago is the Earth flipped from one state to another, from a state with very low oxygen to a state with much higher oxygen. How did that happen? Well, that's one of the big mysteries of astrobiology. And some people think we have ideas. Some people think that, um, uh, that maybe uh, ultraviolet radiation was being screened out by ozone gas that was produced from the first oxygen being belched into the atmosphere. And as that ultraviolet radiation was screened out, so oxygen could hang around for longer. And as it could hang around for longer, it built up in the atmosphere. Other people think that the Earth oxidized uh, by, for example, water. You remember water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen atoms, H2O. If you break up water in the upper atmosphere, you end up with hydrogen and oxygen. And the hydrogen, because it's a very light gas, disappears off into space and the oxygen stays on the Earth. So the planet becomes more and more oxygen rich. The oxygen can build up. And there are other ideas as well. And none of these ideas is mutually exclusive. It could be that there were a number of things going on 2.4 billion years ago that flipped the Earth from one state to another. But flip it did. And we know that the Earth went through this great oxidation event and became more oxidized. What's intriguing is that there were big changes on the Earth at about that time. When oxygen built up um, in the Earth's atmosphere, one of the things it probably did was react with methane gas. Now, methane is a very effective greenhouse gas. It warms our planet. It's much more effective than even carbon dioxide, which is one of the reasons why people are concerned these days about the buildup of not just carbon dioxide, but methane in our atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas that might warm our planet. Well, many billions of years ago, methane was naturally higher in the Earth's atmosphere and probably warmed our planet. And when that belching of oxygen happened, the methane uh, was reacted away out of the atmosphere and there wouldn't have been that greenhouse warming. So some people think that when the oxygen built up in the atmosphere, uh, the earth was less warmed and it was plunged into these um, snowball earth events, as they're called, where the earth would have been completely covered in snow and ice. Now, the snowball earth events uh, probably weren't quite as um, damaging as they sound, the whole of the Earth is probably not covered in ice and snow, probably parts of it, but certainly there's good evidence for glaciations at around this time that oxygen rose. So that's the first great rise in oxygen, the great oxidation event. And it might be um, observed that uh, it's not quite as simple as one big rise. Some people think they see pulses of oxygen before the main rise in the great oxidation event, whiffs of oxygen, as it's sometimes been described. And there's also evidence that oxygen may have dropped off a bit after that first rise. So what used to be one simple rise of oxygen turns out to be quite complicated with variations on either side. But what is uh, not disputed is that at around 2.4 billion years ago, 2.4, 2.2, around that time, there was a large rise in oxygen and our planet flipped from one state to another. And then the Earth trundled along uh, for a couple of billion years or so, or slightly less, and then about 700, 800 million years ago, there was another rise in oxygen to the sorts of levels that we see and we are used to today. And that second rise in oxygen um, was the 
uh, birth, if you like, of our modern world, at least in terms of the availability of oxygen. But what's really interesting about that second rise in oxygen is it produced concentrations of this gas in our atmosphere that was sufficient for uh, aerobic respiration, the sort of thing that you and I do. We eat our sandwiches for lunch and we burn them in oxygen. And that oxygen, that oxidant, is really good for releasing lots of energy. So when that oxygen rose to its second level uh, at around sort of 20% or so, uh, or above about 10%, up to about 20%, the oxygen levels were high enough to be able to create this energetic form of, of, um, of living, this aerobic respiration. And what's really interesting is that after the second rise in oxygen, we see the emergence of animals in the fossil record, the appearance of these pancake-like, frond-like animals, the Ediacara and fauna, that then give rise to the Cambrian explosion, which is this uh, not literal explosion, it's a sudden increase in skeletons and fossil forms in the rock record. And we describe this as a Cambrian explosion because it's like an explosion of life into the rock record. And we think the reason for that is that these early animals had skeletons, and skeletons, because they're hard, made of calcium phosphate, will preserve well in the rock record and so we see uh, this increase in evidence for animals. And what many people think is that this rise in uh, the prevalence of animals is linked to the rise in oxygen, because the oxygen made possible this energy rich form of living, uh, running, jumping, flying, all those things that large animals do. Suddenly there was the energy available to do that because of this powerful oxidant in the atmosphere, oxygen, that was now at sufficient concentrations to be able to do this. It wasn't as if it didn't exist before because as we just saw, it rose during the great oxidation event, but the second rise in oxygen took it to levels where it was sufficient to power all these large multicellular animals. And once that energy became available, then the biosphere in all of its wondrous forms uh, and larger forms than microbes suddenly became possible. So that is in essence, uh, the history of oxygen in our planet. Now, there are some other interesting things that we observe as well. There's a, an oxygen pulse about 350 million years ago, uh, which is a period when oxygen levels were higher than we know today. So today, they're at 21%. People think that about 350 million years ago, oxygen levels rose to about 30% or so. Uh, and that's interesting because that period in Earth history is a period where we see giant insects, dragonflies with uh, meter wingspans and giant centipedes. And some people have suggested that um, these giant insects owe their existence to this rise in oxygen. Because unlike you and I, you and I breathe our air in through our lungs very actively. Insects rely on diffusion uh, generally for that oxygen to get into the insect body. So the idea is if there was higher levels of oxygen, the oxygen would have diffused into insect bodies uh, much more effectively because it was at a higher concentration and allowed larger insects to grow. Well, that's controversial. Some people uh, don't believe that. Some people think the higher concentrations of oxygen would have created higher concentrations of damaging oxygen-free radicals that react with biological compounds and break them down. So some people make the perfectly reasonable argument that in fact, higher concentrations of oxygen may not have been uh, a driver for becoming larger. Uh, and there are other arguments besides. But anyway, it makes a nice story, uh, except the data may not support the idea that the uh, gigantic insects were linked to the rise of oxygen. But it does underline a basic fact, and that is that life on Earth has been um, fashioned by the presence of oxygen in our atmosphere. The rise of animals, the great changes uh, about two and a half billion years ago during the great oxidation event, the planet and life have co-evolved. Life has produced lots of oxygen and the earth has responded to that oxygen. In other words, the earth and life are in a continuous dance, continuously interacting with one another, co-evolving, as we would say. The planet and life co-evolve uh, side by side, influencing each other. So although uh, life on earth can sometimes be a hapless passenger in the history of our planet, pummeled by asteroid and comet impacts, it's also important to remember that life itself has radically changed the direction of our planet. And the great oxidation event, the great pollution event caused by cyanobacteria producing all this oxygen gas is one of the most profound changes to our planet 
caused by biology. So that's not to give us an excuse to pollute the planet and to destroy the environment, but it is worth remembering uh, that human beings are small fry in the long-term history of our planet. And in fact, great changes have occurred on this world caused by humble uh, bacteria, cyanobacteria, uh, two and a half billion years ago or thereabouts. So life uh, very much has shaped the past of our planet and will shape the future of our planet just as human beings are doing to the planet today. So that's the oxygen you breathe next time you take a breath, next time you get out of your house, which is hopefully not too far in the future, you can walk out into your garden and take a breath of oxygen and contemplate the monumental, monumentous uh, history of our planet that led to the rise of that gas and allowed you to get all that good oxygen to breathe, to burn those sandwiches, to make lots of energy and to power um, that brain in the top of your head, which incidentally takes about 25 watts uh, of power to run, uh, which may not sound much. I often like to point out to my students uh, that the human brain is dimmer than a, than a light bulb. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that's where the energy comes from. Uh, the, the food you eat burning in that oxygen produced by those humble cyanobacteria many billions of years ago who've been churning out this oxygen ever since. Thank you for joining me. Uh, take care of yourselves. Bye.